Hello, my queens. <laughs> Hello, difficult women, nasty women. Men who are ready to do the work and learn. <laughs> and whoever else is here. <laughs> it is an honor to be here to celebrate Roxane Gay's new short story collection, Difficult Women. Often at the beginning of a new year, and certainly after the kind of year we just endured and mostly survived, I turn to a line from Zora Neale Hurston's classic 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. As Hurston wrote, and I very much believe, there are years that ask questions and years that answer. It is my deep pleasure to be here with all of you tonight as we celebrate yet another year in which Roxane Gay through her art, intellect, spirit, and generous brilliance, has announced that she is ready to answer us again. She is here to answer our fierce need for art with the capacity to reintroduce us to ourselves. And if ever there was a moment in which every American needed to do some self-reflection, this is the moment. Reading the 21 short stories in Difficult Women, stories about women made of glass, sharp as knives, women chased by rain, disaster, and disastrous men, I couldn't help but notice a theme of twins and doubling begin to emerge. New love links arms with past losses. Two best friends, both beautiful, angry, and too smart for the men in their lives, start a basement fight club. All women, no boys allowed. <laughs> a woman pretends not to notice that her husband and his twin brother are constantly switching places, <laughs> often in the middle of the night. When one young girl is pulled into a pedophile's van. Without hesitating, her younger sister jumps in too, refusing to force her to experience it alone. As a character says later in the story, my sister was the only place that made any sense. In stories shot through with magic, in stories so realistic you would be forgiven for wondering if briefly, the book has somehow devoured you and our world whole, Roxane Gay pushes us to reconsider the collection's title. You see, the title Difficult Women itself evokes a kind of twinship. After all, difficult women don't come out of nowhere. They don't just happen. Rather, the women in these stories are the twins of the rage, neglect, obsession, and misogyny our culture forces upon them. These characters, each with as many facets as a perfectly cut black diamond, dare us to fear their supposed difficulty and challenge us to consider the question, what do women have to become in order to survive the America we insist they live in. Please join me in welcoming Roxane Gay. Thank you. Oh, I get the hug. Well, New York, geez, a lot of people in here. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. Uh, no, 
thank you so much, Saeed. Wow, I've never heard my work spoken of in such accurate and gorgeous <laughs> terms. <laughs> if I do say so myself. Uh, so I have a book out called Difficult Women, the book that's making everyone ask, but what about the men? <laughs> I don't give a damn. <laughs> Um, I can't remember where I was, but, oh, I was doing an interview with my friend Brad Listy, who was a man, and he was like, do you like men? That's the number one question I get. Men are very concerned about what I think of them. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> That's real power. <laughs> so I thought I would just read a couple stories from difficult women, and um, then... I'm gonna talk with Saeed because I find that conversation is better than being read to, because I hate being read to. Uh, but this is a really short story called Open Marriage. And one time I read this story and a woman got sick. <laughs> but I didn't know that it was gross. <laughs> we are having a heated debate about whether or not yogurt can expire when my husband suggests we stay together but see other people. He says open marriage intrigues him, that he couldn't be happier, but that he read this article online. I tell him yogurt cannot expire because it is filled with bacteria. I do not know if this is true, but I have seen commercials about yogurt that mention things like bacteria and the word <laughs> probiotic, so I feel I have a sufficient command of the topic. I give him a look. I say, he's welcome to try to find other women to sleep with, but that I'm fine. And his face falls because he thinks I'm playing a trick on him. I'm not. He has no game, none at all. <laughs> if I hadn't taken matters in hand, we would still be sitting on his couch in his bachelor apartment, his arms snaking around my shoulder after every yawn. I am not worried. <laughs> he's the kind of man who gets ideas, but is largely unable to follow through on those ideas. He shoves his hands into his jeans. This is something he does often, wearing right through the pockets of most of his pants. He leans against a kitchen counter. He says he wants cultivating an open marriage to be something we do together. I politely decline once more. I say, I'm not inclined to open my half of the marriage, which only confuses him further because I'm quick-tempered and what he calls feisty, which only means that I talk back to him and give him roadhead once in a while. <laughs> And I'm the first woman who has ever done that in his limited experience, so it is still something of a novelty, still something that requires terminology. I take a bite of the yogurt that started our scientific debate. It expired more than two months ago, but appears edible. <laughs> when I dip my spoon into the plastic container, the yogurt gives way easily. It tastes sour. My husband's face is red and sweat beads on his upper lip. He asks if I would seriously be fine with him having no strings attached sex with another woman, and I say, yes, baby, of course. He tells me I'm amazing in bed, but that it's not about being unsatisfied, and I say, yes, baby, of course. I rock his world on the regular, and we both know it. <laughs> he can barely string three words together after we make love. He just lies there trying to catch his breath, muttering, god damn, over and over. I say, good luck and be safe and don't you break my heart, baby. Don't you break my heart. His eyes widen. I eat the entire container of yogurt, even going so far as to scrape the sides until it is clean. I vocalize my appreciation for the expired yogurt and do a lot of elaborate spoon licking. <laughs> I hold my husband's gaze the entire time. He was a virgin when we married, so he looks away first. <laughs> also, I laugh at my own jokes. It's, <laughs> it's a fatal flaw, but I'm also very funny. <laughs> oh, a little blue mug. So my parents moved to Florida uh, six, 17 years ago now, and they will no longer come to places where it goes below 60 degrees. And that's why they're not here tonight. <laughs> and uh, joke's on them. <laughs> it's a balmy 70 degrees. 
Uh, and so this is a story called Florida about their gated community, but it's fictional. <laughs> 33, 33, Palmetto Crest Circle. The adjustment had been uncomfortable. All her life, Marcy had lived in the Midwest with people who ate red meat and starchy foods, who allowed their bodies to spread without shame. And then her husband was transferred to Naples. Marcy's mother said, Naples, like in Italy? And Marcy said, no, Florida. And her mother said, oh dear. <laughs> the women in Naples all looked the same lean and darkly tan, their faces narrow with hunger discipline, whittled by the same surgeon. <laughs> they stared at Marcy's relatively ample physique with disgust or envy or something between the two. At night, Marcy worried about her ass and thighs. Her husband always said, baby, you are perfect, and she flushed angrily. His assurances were so reflexive as to be insulting. In Omaha, they lived in a neighborhood. In Naples, they moved into a gated community, Palmetto Landing, where each estate was blandly unique and sprawling. Tall facades, lots of glass and balustrades around the windows, Spanish tile on the roofs. The streets cobbled with tiny square br bricks. The first time they drove up to the gatehouse, manned by a white-haired gentleman in polyester, Marcy leaned forward to study the landscaping, tall cypresses encircled by Peruvian lilies looming over the guardhouse. She sighed and said, this is a bit much. Her husband said, baby, people love the illusion of safety and the spectacle of enclosure. They were given barcoded stickers for their cars. Their community had a country club. They joined because the transfer came with a promotion and a raise. Marcy's husband said it was important to live up to their new station. He mostly wanted to play golf with men whose bellies were fatter than his. In Palmetto Landing, the men's bodies expanded in inverse proportion to those of their wives. Each morning, there was a group fitness class at the clubhouse, spinning, Zumba, kickboxing, always something different. The instructor was a young, aggressively fit woman, Caridad. The other wives loved to say their name, say her name, trilling their R's to show Caridad, ellas hablan español. <laughs> Marcy stood in the back of the studio in sweatpants and an old t-shirt of her husband's while the women around her perspired in their perfectly coordinated outfits, most of them fancier than Marcy's entire wardrobe. Marcy enjoyed the pleasant soreness as she drove the five blocks home after each class. <laughs> she liked for how an hour each day there was a precise set of instructions she was meant to follow, a clear sense of direction. The other wives were quietly fascinated by Marcy in that she was a rare species in the wealthy enclave, a first wife. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Katz, who lived three doors down, often squeezed Marcy's shoulder with her cool bony hand. She'd say, we're rooting for you, kid, and <laughs> offered words of encouragement as Marcy's figure slimmed. Marcy never knew what to say during these moments, but she smiled politely because she understood these people and how they existed only in relation to those around them. <laughs> yeah, skipping the boring ones. No, they're not boring, they're all great. <laughs> 4411 Palmetto Pines Way. At first, news of the brothel was only a rumor. Men would rush in and out of the spa in Palmetto Landing at all hours, often looking harried on the way in and very relaxed on the way out. <laughs> but we had no proof. Then, Evelyn Marshall caught her husband getting a blowjob. She was getting a hot stone massage and heard a familiar groan in the adjacent room. <laughs> News spread through our small community quickly, but no one alerted the authorities. We felt important having such goings on in our midst. In the afternoon, the therapists often sit on the large lanai behind the spa in negligees and peignoirs and heavy makeup, smoking and drinking bright colored fruity drinks, waiting for their next clients. My front balcony looks out onto this lanai where the ladies lounge. They are not as beautiful as you might imagine, but they are interesting and talk loudly. They never seem to sweat despite the humidity. Their voices are deep and velvety in the way of women who know things. I sit on my balcony most afternoons, wearing a pair of dark sunglasses. I hold a book in my lap and pretend to read. One of the women who works at the spa is very tall, the kind of tall in a woman that makes people stare. 
She has long dark hair she always wears down. She is beautiful and I love looking at her, how she moves, the anger in her eyes. She caught me staring once, stood up, her robe falling open. She lifted a leg and propped it on the railing and pointed between her thighs, then threw her hands in the air. I did not stop staring. She did not close her legs. I went to see her. The woman at the desk studied me carefully. She said, Nadia is one of our special therapists. She charges high fees. I said, I know. The receptionist shrugged. Soon after, I was escorted into the back. I heard interesting sounds. Nadia had a thick Russian accent, but spoke English well. You want massage, candles, what, she asked. I said, I want to fuck. The words felt heavy and strange in my mouth. Nadia cocked her head to the side. You are different, she said. Later, her tongue was cool and soft between my thighs. I twisted my fingers through her hair, resting my heels on her back. I wanted to explain myself. It took a long time to come. It always does. But Nadia was patient. I reciprocated her attentions. I wasn't afraid. As I was leaving, I ran into my next door neighbor. She pulled her purse closer to her body and looked away. I pressed my hand against my neighbor's shoulder as we passed. She still refused to look at me, but she leaned into my touch. Now, Nadia stares at me when she's on her lanai and I am up on my balcony. I don't look away. My husband calls me a wildcat. After we make love, he always whistles under his breath and slaps my thigh. He says, God damn woman, you're gonna kill me. On our wedding day, my mother pulled me aside at the chapel. I was only half dressed, walking around in white pantyhose, a corset, and white patent leather heels. My dress was a monstrosity of satin and chiffon, and I wanted to wear it for as little as possible. We stood in a dark vestibule, and my mother began straightening my curls, pulling them out of my face, messing with the pearl headband holding my hair back. She said, look, there's no mystery to keeping a man. She dabbed at my lipstick with a tissue she had been holding, folded in the palm of her hand. She said, you do whatever sick thing he wants, when he wants, and you will never have a problem. That was the only advice she has ever given me. <laughs> she and my father divorced when I was nine. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my queen. Hello. <laughs> Wow, there's not an empty seat in the house. I know, what's up? Uh, I'm gonna Snapchat this later. Yeah, were, we t <laughs> were we talking about Anderson Cooper backstage, by oh, the way? Oh, sure we were. Mm -hmm. Anderson Cooper didn't have this many people. <laughs> but we you can know. have Anderson Cooper. Oh. Oh, this is live streaming. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. What's up, Anderson? Yeah, uh, I, I just know he's watching. <laughs> he is, I'm sure. Riveted. I'm like, oh, Riveted. forget about my show on CNN. Yeah, him and Megyn Kelly sitting on the couch with popcorn, girl. Mm. Um, so uh, we're going to chat. <laughs> we're going to do this. Uh, and for like an hour. For <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, and, and then uh, there will be time for questions. Uh, there actually aren't going to be note cards tonight. Uh, so you're just going to uh, stand in the house and, uh, you know, uh, project. Uh, and and we'll we'll get to the the question and answer rules when we get there. So, did you notice there's a clock right here? Oh, I just saw it. Oh, oh okay. What well, that helps. Like? It does. Okay, uh, I'll move my phone. Um, well, so a question I like to ask every writer uh, after they've published a book is, who are you now that you've published this book? I'm a difficult woman. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Just wow. There. Boom. Now, I think um, today, I, having published this book, I feel like the dream finally came true because this was the very first book I ever tried to sell. Wow. Yes. And I just feel so smug about it now. <laughs> As you should. So many editors said no, and <laughs> suckers. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I just feel like this was the book that I loved and that I really wanted to see out into the world because I'm a f short story writer first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Everything else is n relatively new to me. So I just feel accomplished. Yeah. And, and it's um, amazing, I mean, because North Country 
is here, a story that was in um, Best Collected Short Stories, Best, Best American, American Fiction, yes. um, and, and newer work as well. But you've also, now you are writing your memoir. You are writing Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I had a friend who was like, I keep, I think, he, I think Fred is here. Um, and he was like, I keep, oh, there you are, Fred. Fred was like, I keep trying to go to the comic book store in, in Brooklyn to buy it, and it's just like, it's gone. He's like, can you hold it? And the dudes are like, sorry, dog. Like, <laughs> amazing. So yes. that's flying off the shelf. You wrote a screenplay. I wrote a screenplay a couple weeks ago. For, yeah. Is that for an untamed state? Yes. <laughs> I did. Amazing. And you're working on Hunger, your memoir. Yeah, Hunger is almost, Hunger is, coming out June 13th. Okay. <laughs> so, as a New Yorker, I know that when people ask you what I'm about to ask you, you say, well, I don't live in New York. Amen. We're gonna push past it. We're gonna push past it. I want more. How are you doing all of this? Because you're, you're doing it well. There, there's you. no shortcuts. There's no, you know. How are you navigating all of these genres, these different projects? Very carefully. I'm not navigating it well. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm late on absolutely everything. Okay. Like, oh, this is live streamed, but uh, the screenplay was due on December 15th, and I started writing it on December 16th. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I, I wrote it in two weeks and sent it in. Um, so I procrastinate and think a lot about what I want right. to do in my head, uh -huh. and then I do it in a really compressed amount of time right. and then turn it in. Right. And I, I uh, as my editors, many of whom are here tonight, will attest, Deadlines and I are not super great. <laughs> um, but I also don't have children. That helps a lot. It does. I've read and articles. I, I love kids, but mm -hmm. oh my God. Just, I was with my niece for two weeks over the holiday, and I was just like, I need to think, little person. I need you to stop. <laughs> She just asks questions, and everything is why, and then we were playing on Snapchat, and we were doing this Hello Kitty thing. Like the filter? The filter, okay. thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that was, the kids taught me. That was the 42 in me. And I had a red bow, and she had a yellow one, and she was like, but why do you have the red one? And I was like, because I'm awesome. And she's like, I'm going to switch sides. And so she switched sides, and she was still the yellow bow. And she's like, <laughs> real salty about it. And then she was like, and she moved and the red bow jumped to her. And so we had to spend the rest of the day talking about how she managed to get the red bow from me. <laughs> and so because I don't have to deal with that on a daily basis, <laughs> it, it, it creates a lot of time. <laughs> Touche. Yes. I keep thinking about the live stream and you're always so tempted to be like, oh, it's just us, like a safe space, just you, me, and 650 people. Yes. Um, but it's like Twitter, so. That, yeah, I mean, uh, the ship has sailed yeah. uh, at talks because people tweet, which I'm totally fine with, but um, so the audience is never going to be just like this intimate space, right. always going to be far more, which is flattering right. and terrifying at the same time. Right, yeah. And, well, and let's talk about Twitter. Oh, yeah. Shall we? Shall we shall because today, oh fucking man. <laughs> what was your day on Twitter like? Well, today a man I don't know uh, <laughs> tweeted at me. It just took my female friend oh. eight pages to realize Roxanne Gay's book is garbage. As you can see, I memorized that negative criticism. <laughs> I read that shit once, and it's seared on my brain. And. I was just like hurt, <laughs> and so that was that took up a lot of my day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually saw that because I. So listen, Twitter's so toxic. First of all, I'm not even on Twitter right now. I've yeah, I he deleted, deleted Twitter it from my phone. Um, I, I glance at it at work. You know, it's like it's wild out there. Um, and so Roxanne actually, we text <laughs> each yeah. other instead of tweeting each other. Um, but and something I said to you the other day is like I'm starting to wonder if Twitter is worth all the poison we, and particularly women, people of color, uh, trans people, have to swallow, is it worth the medicine we're making out of it? I agree. That's a big question for me because I've long said I will not leave Twitter because I do enjoy it and because mm -hmm. when I'm in Indiana, it's so nice to feel connected to a larger community of people who I find interesting. And many people are so funny and so smart on Twitter. 
But then things like this happened. I mean, this guy was, it was nothing. He was just getting on my nerves, but he tagged me. He could have said that without tagging me because I actually don't um, keep a search on my name on Twitter because it's too mean and I um, am sensitive. <laughs> and so You're human. I am human, really. Yeah. And so I actually do not go looking. The only thing, I do have a Google alert, but I don't search like within social media for myself because A, that's a bit much. <laughs> and I, I just don't need it. And so he wanted me to see this. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how much longer I want to be part of a space where people do that. Like, have your opinion, hate my book, I get it. I'm laughing all the way to the bank, so <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's just, it's, it is toxic and right. it is unhealthy and, and in, I think that so many people have become emboldened by November 8th and just the travesty of what happened and so now it, anything goes. But what's interesting is that it's not happening in real life per se, mm. because I, I live in Indiana in a small town with a, a significant clan presence, and things are fine there. Things that people are acting normal, but there is something about the online space where people just let go of every terrible thought they've ever had, mm -hmm. and then Twitter rewards them mm. by not taking them out of that space and saying this is the freedom of speech. No, that's not what freedom of speech is. They can say that, but you can also take their account away. That's the freedom of owning Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm on the fence now. Yeah. Was there, setting, a, yes, <laughs> setting aside the election, <laughs> as if we could do that, um, was there a moment before the election where you, you felt the turn? Because I, I've been on Twitter since 2008, mm -hmm. and I think you were on it uh, just a year before, 2007. Okay, okay. Ooh, I can't even imagine what that was like. Ye olden days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, and in many ways I still feel like I have 200 followers and right. a locked account, mm -hmm. and it's hard to... Oh, right, you were locked when I was became, locked okay. until and I, I had like, about 2,000 followers, and then I was like, yeah. well, that ship sailed, so yeah. it's time to unlock the account. Yeah. Um, so was there a moment where, where you first were like, oh, this is... Not just in terms of obviously the, your platform and as you're publishing work and you were editing and really, you know, really building a community of writers and I'm very grateful to be a part of that. But was there a moment where you started to feel the toxicity that we now almost take for granted? I think 2015 mm -hmm. and I don't, I can't pin it to a specific moment, but the sort of, it's not even conservative. It's the virulent like alt-right white supremacist men and women, there are some women involved, just started to do this swarming thing mm. and regularly mm -hmm. and it was just relentless mm -hmm. and it hasn't gone away. They just, mm -hmm. they gang up on Reddit or some other forum and decide this is the person we're going to attack today. And what's horrifying is that they feel righteous about this. They feel like they're doing something and I'm like, you're in a basement covered in Cheetos, like, <laughs> you're not doing anything. And when I turn the computer off, life will go on. Mm. But what's changed is that people have started to take this off of Twitter. Mm. Like, people call my job. And wow. I teach at a state university in a conservative state. And so I, I have tenure now, so it's fine. But um, <laughs> 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 it feels so good sometimes. Yeah. It's just like, it. hate all know. you want. You cannot get me fired. <laughs> but it's embarrassing when my department chair is like, I just spend an hour on the phone with a man named Fred who's mad that you blocked him on Twitter because he would like access to you. This is a true story. Um, and so that they're taking it that far and that they're also publishing the addresses of women mm -hmm. who they don't like and me and, or men or queer people um, who they're opposed to, that's when it becomes dangerous because one of these wing nuts is someday going to have a gun. And whew, that's not going to be a good day. And so as much as we'd like to say it's just the internet, right. it's actually becoming more than the internet in some very terrifying ways. And I think we have to look at that. Right. And I think Twitter needs to face reality and face that these things are moving beyond their platform. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so in, in the midst of the, the tremendous change, and, and a lot of this is, is wonderful change mm -hmm. in your career, but also 
you know, the, the toxicity and certainly the political landscape, you were doing excellent work. And so I, I, I do really, I want to talk about difficult women. Oh, yeah. More. Um, I will follow you. Mm -hmm. um, I made the mistake of reading it on the subway. <laughs> Oh. I wasn't ready. <laughs> yes, I should put a little note in each book. Oh, man. Just like, do you have extra wig glue? Because, <laughs> like, you know, prepare yourself. This, this story is going to snatch it. Um, <laughs> you know, so if, if you have not uh, gotten your hands on the book yet, I hope you will. Um, and I Will Follow You is the first story in the book. Do you want to kind of uh, set it up a little bit? I don't want to. Yes, let me see if I can remember. No, that, that was, I, I just amuse myself with dumb stuff. <laughs> um, so in the story, it's a story about two sisters and their bond. Uh, when they're very young, one of the sisters is kidnapped and pulled into a van and her other sister jumps in the van after her because she doesn't want her sister to be alone, whatever is about to happen next. And they're kidnapped and they're held for a couple months and then released and it's about where they are in the present day um, as they receive a note from the man who kidnapped him, who is in prison and would like forgiveness. And you know, how they face that question of, do we forgive this man who has done something so terrible to us? And so it is a dark story as many of my stories are wont to be, but I think it's also a hopeful story as many of my stories are wont to be because mostly it's about the bond between these sisters mm -hmm. and how they did not let this thing tear them apart. It only brought them closer and they survived because of each other. Mm -hmm. And it is very beautiful, their relation. That, and that's where the line, um, my sister is the only place that made any sense comes from, was just, you know. Um, and, and thinking formally, mm -hmm. um, I, I was very moved by, by the structure of the story. We're in, in the present tense, um, and we're seeing them as adults negotiating, you know, years later, um, how they've developed a very close relationship that is, they don't even really bother to explain to other people in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and then we see flashbacks and we begin to see what happened to them and it makes sense. What I thought was so interesting, I guess what I wanted to ask you is that um, sometimes when people write flashbacks and are jumping back, one section is uh, kind of static, mm -hmm. right? It's, there's not a lot of development, but both were both aspects of their lives were just as dynamic and developing and you weren't sure what was going to happen, even when you had the basic information. Mm -hmm. how, how did you navigate that? How'd you do that? I started the story in present tense, imagining these two sisters who were really close. And what happens if your sister bursts into your bedroom while you're sleeping with your boyfriend and is like, we've got to go to Reno. Like what would cause that? So I actually started the story with that scene. Mm -hmm. And then I started to build the backstory. And so I wrote them linear, in a linear way in two different times. Mm -hmm. uh, so that by the end of the story, you have the full picture and you have this full understanding of how we start at the beginning again and understand why the sister was like, ah, yeah, let's go. We're going to Reno. I guess. Middle of the night, okay. Sure thing. Right. And <laughs> I love that there, are, there can be people in your life for whom you will do something without question. Mm -hmm. And what creates that bond where you will do something without question? And so that's how I structured the story because I didn't want to give it to the reader all at once. I wanted it to build over time so that you could understand the backstory while you're also understanding what's happening in the present. Yeah. And, and, and throughout the, the stories, and it's, it's amazing, some stories are, are kind of micro fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I Will Follow You is somewhat cinematic. Yes. Uh, baby Arm is kind of, you know, fight club, magical realism. Um, and, and then like North Country, like, you know, full, full real, it's just, I'm not, I can't even. Um, <laughs> what I think is interesting is shot through so many of those stories is women and, and kind of like this Florida, right? The, this connection with Nadia, mm -hmm. like that just kind of cuts through all of the other relationships and it doesn't matter if a man stand next to you in a relationship, like these moments where women really see each other almost with a, an intense silence. Is that a really important uh, idea for you in all of your work? It is, absolutely. Uh, you know, so often everything caters to the male gaze and I just am not interested in that as a writer. And so I want to write stories where women are centered, mm. even if 
their stories exist in part because of something that has happened with a man. Yeah. Or as yeah. in with North Country, it's a good story about a good man who does, is a good person. Um, he's patient. Yeah, he's very patient. <laughs> as men have to be with people like me. <laughs> um, and as they deserve to be. Uh, <laughs> I just really am interested in the stories of women right. and the ways in which, even when we don't get along, I think there's an understanding between women of like, yes, we know similar things and our bodies know similar experiences and that common ground means something. Mm -hmm. And I love exploring that in my fiction. Mm -hmm. It's just a very exciting place to me and there's so much narrative potential there. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just a, it's an obsession of mine. Is there, I want to ask you about some of your favorites. Is there a favorite uh, kind of female gaze kind of connection moment in, in the story or friendship? Oh, I, I love the sisters and mm -hmm. I will follow you. I love the friends in baby arms. Yes. Yeah, baby Take. arm is such a good, st I mean, oh, not such a good <laughs> stand. It's so it's, good. No, it came about because <laughs> my best friend worked, um, at a store, I mean at a company that made weird things. And one day she sent me a mannequin arm. <laughs> and Wait, so this really happened? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> baby arm is real. I still have it. Oh yeah, baby arm is real. And so she sent me this baby arm because she knows that I love baby parts. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just thought, what, let me write a story about I love it. two women that are so intimately connected that one knows that the best gift you could give her is a baby arm. <laughs> and I mean, not a real baby arm. <laughs> it, it's a mannequin arm, but it's fantastic. And so the, the connection that those women have yeah. is really fun to me. It's so good. And really exciting. And also what I, what I love about that is that it's not born out of sorrow or right. pain. They're just women who really love each other. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting too, the, the fight club scene, because I was like, okay, this is interesting. And it wasn't, they, I mean, it's all women in this basement um, beating each other up. Like I was like wincing um, a, as I was reading and it was funny, just like our, our friend Isaac Fitzgerald just published a beautiful essay about his own teenage fight club. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, but there were, and, and you both had the same thing. It was just joy. It was yeah. just like friendship. Sometimes just being physical and, I think for these women who uh, have these very constrained lives in, in their day jobs and they're expected to be women in very specific ways, in the fight club they get to let loose and they get to be violent and they get to do so in a way that's safe and in a way that's contained and in a way where everybody is playing by the same rules, which is not how things are in the world. And so that was just... A, f a fun scene to write to just you know like what would happen if a bunch of women just get together and um, that they had a very specific set of rules um, about how they were going to be violent with each other and that was just a fun thing to create pretty amazing uh, was there a moment in one of the stories or was there a story that just the way it emerged because it seems like you you do you think you think you think you think and then you write mm -hmm. that maybe once it was over or once the scene was kind of mostly together, surprised you? Yeah, I think North Country surprised me the most also. because I didn't know where the story was gonna end. Mm. I just wanted to stay in the story forever because it was so joyful mm. to write. And Romantic. Yes, yeah. I'm a romantic at heart. And so I just loved just like this perfect romance between this burly logger man and this sort of bitchy scientist and uh, who's just very particular mm -hmm. and that they could find a way to be together and that she's more than just her prickly exterior. Mm -hmm. And so what surprised me was finding a quiet place to where to end that story and to not give in to my desire to make it a 20,000 word story. Mm. Oh, I it was close. I, I feel like I could see a screenplay. Mm. I, I feel like a lot of your- Stay maybe, tuned. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. Oh yeah. Do no we have news? Do we have tea? We have tea. <laughs> we have tea that can't be shared yet. Okay, we'll talk later. But it's delicious. <laughs> I'll text you. Yes. I'll text you. Um, well, I, well I, without spoiling anything, you, you've written a screenplay now. Yes. You often, your work often does have a cinematic quality. I mean, and I think, you know, anyone who read An Untamed State um, and, and, and I would argue actually part of what made the experience 
challenging and really forced you as a reader to kind of stand up you know, and, and face, the, face the truth as much as you did um, is because it's so cinematic. So what was it like working on the, the screenplay for An Untamed State? That was intense because I've never done anything like that before. So it was entirely new. And so in the months leading up to the actual writing, I read a bunch of screenplays because that's how I, I just teach myself how to do something by just reading a lot. And so I looked at different screenplays, especially for movies I had already seen, so I could sort of like reverse engineer hmm. what I had seen on the screen and understand how the screenplay would then translate. How they made it happen. Yes. And then I sat down with my book. Well, my d the director is Gina Prince Bythewood, <coughs> who is brilliant. And uh, she directed Love and Basketball, Beyond the Lights, and The Secret Life of Bees. And I knew I wanted to work with her. I know. I like <laughs> Y'all are just, this is wonderful. It is. You know, the moment you walked out, it was just like. I, it, was, it was very <laughs> gratifying <laughs> and a bit sexual. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to work with her because I think that she tells love stories and treats black women as lovable people mm. in really gorgeous ways. And so she's my co-writer, and so now I've given her the first draft, and she's going to revise it and fix everything I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but before I sat down to write a couple months ago, we did sit down and decide which parts of the novel are we going to put into the screenplay, because it couldn't all make it in. And Why not? Just because of uh, Because length, then it would be a four-hour movie. Oh, okay. Yes. I mean? Yeah, no, definitely listen, length. And listen, so white men love making <laughs> shit. <laughs> Four hours. Let's talk about that because <laughs> can we have a moment? We can have a moment. moment. I just saw the Revenant. Oh. <laughs> and and it's complicated because you know it's got my boo Tom Hardy. Oh, he was great. Yes. Oh, I mean he yes. was just like so disgusting, oh. and I was like, oh. you could get it exactly yes. as that mountain man. Yes. <laughs> Unshowered. Hunt us. Mm. Hunt us, Tom Hardy. Just skin me alive. <laughs> he is. He's fine. Like, he has a new show Woo! coming up that I'm really excited to see. Is it called, like, Taboo or something? It's called, I think it's called Taboo. All I know is that, that feels right. Is very that really? scantily clad. Uh, yeah. But The Revenant was not good. And <laughs> it was also very, very long. Okay. It was just very, very, very long. Jeez. And so much of it was just, like, crawling and grunting. and. I love Leonardo DiCaprio because he was in Titanic. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I just choose to believe they gave him the Oscar for Titanic. Reasonable. Yes. That is a reasonable assumption. It is. But yeah, the movie can't be four hours long. So we decided which are the key <laughs> moments. And then I sat down with the book and uh, final draft and read the final draft manual and then just wrote the screenplay. <laughs> Like yeah. brilliant women do. You know. Um, one more question about men, and then we'll like, you know. Because uh, I know the, the lead, has the lead been cast for an state? Mm -hmm. Did I dream that up? Was that fan fiction? No, the lead is Gugu Mbatha Ra. OK. OK. I um, agree. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. I met her, and she's dewy. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> Yeah, her okay. and Black Mirror, the San Junipero era. I haven't Ooh. seen that yet. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like the one Black Mirror episode that like does not hurt you. Oh. Hi <laughs> highly recommend, highly recommend. I'm gonna check it out. I won't she give anything gorgeous away. Bell. You'd love it. All right. Um, have you, has, oh, because a coworker asked about the husband in an Untamed State. Has that been cast yet? No. Does Chris Evans have a shot? No. That was, that was the question. No, I actually don't know. I mean, I think that you have to run before you walk, and so I'm, Gina is the director, and I am gonna be involved just, I think, by the grace of her benevolence, but I chose, I don't wanna be a control freak. I um, have forced myself to like divest from the process mm -hmm. because I'm a control freak. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. Yeah, I think when you put two alpha type women together, you have to, you know, she's the bigger alpha. <laughs> and, <laughs> I respect that. And so I'm actually just going to follow her lead and mm -hmm. trust her with my book. And okay. so I have opinions. I wanted Channing Tatum. <laughs> we get it. We I get don't it. I don't think you could that's have like a dance happen. scene, no. Oh, he would be so good because I think he's the kind of actor who's looking right now for like a breakout dramatic role. You know the way 
it's just. <laughs> he's trying. He's trying to Chris Pratt himself. As you himself. can see, like I have made a very you elaborate about pitch. This. You see about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So you think Channing Tatum's trying to do the Chris Pratt like? Yes, yeah, like to go serious, and um, I think that he would make an amazing Michael, and ultimately exactly, inept. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. but still very nice to look at and good in bed. And what more do you need? Check, check, check. Yep. Check, check, check. I would love that, but I, it's I. I think he might be too big a star, and. I don't what? know. <laughs> I love him. Okay. <laughs> you said it's the neck. It's the neck. I just want to... <sighs> <laughs> Get ready, 92nd Street. Why? I just want to just, I want to just like chew it. Just... <laughs> it's just so thick and meaty and... <laughs> he's just so, he looks very kind and just... I think that he's actually bright, but he always takes these roles where he seems to acknowledge, like, I'm not bright, but I'm, I'm kind and I'm beautiful. And that just makes me want to gnaw on him. Just <laughs> delicious, Channing, delicious. <laughs> and then I just want to pet him a little bit. <laughs> He also has amazing thighs. Yeah, I know. And also, <laughs> <laughs> amazing arms. And in Magic Mike XXL, uh, <laughs> when she like when Jada Pinkett's really trying to oh, like and she's antagonize amazing. him, she's so oh, good she's in it. Flawless. Oh, she is lady. flawless. Oh, what did she say? Did she queens? Queens. Queens. And then she's uh. like white chocolate, and I'm just like. <sighs> <laughs> White chocolate can melt all over me. And he does that dance where he props himself up on the women and then like gyrates. And then when he's in his workshop and <laughs> he's just the she dance. She did not come to play games with you hosts. I did not. He just felt the dance. He was just working and grinding. No. And <laughs> he had to dance right then. And Genuine's Pony just <gasps> happened to be on the radio. <laughs> Which I think is an amazing coincidence, and I love him. That was beautiful. Okay. Thank you. I'm a poet. You are. <laughs> Woo. 92nd Street Y Internet, you were welcome for that. <laughs> I uh, mean, you opened that door. I did. I, you know, we had to like. You, <laughs> you know. let me right in. I'm uh, like, let's just get comfortable. <laughs> One last question before we turn it over to the audience. Yes. Um, I, you, this is uh, the only the second event you've done for this book, by the way. Yes, I just did. And, and your first event in New York City, which is very exciting. Yes. Um, really awesome. Really awesome. Um, and so, you know, before you get asked this 700 times, um, I imagine you've been asked it like 699 times. Uh, how would, uh, what's the relationship between bad feminist and difficult women? They're both printed on paper. <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people in the discussions I've seen of the book have said that um, they can see my nonfiction leanings in my fiction. Mm -hmm. And as I think a lot of people assume this book came after. Right. Uh, and so that's been really interesting. But I think the relationship is that the things that matter to me matter to me no matter what genre I'm writing in. And thinking about women and the place of women in the world and also having a romantic streak and trying to be hopeful in a world that denigrates hope on the regular, um, <coughs> you can see that those strains of interest and obsession are in both books. And so there definitely, there is a trajectory okay. between my stories and my essays. Um, yeah. Right on, Queen. Thank you. Okay, first of all, a round of applause for this. I, I really believe in 2017, it's very important to celebrate what we can, you yeah. know? Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna have questions, and it's gonna we're gonna flow. We'll probably vibe or whatever. Oh, okay. Wow, Ooh, I can. The lights are up. Look All right. You. Look at you. Look at you. Beautiful. Oh, okay. Well, okay. now we can do Snapchat. Right. Do Snapchat. 
and take some pictures. Here's the thing. This is crazy. Very impressive. You were ready, girl. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I was born ready. You were born ready. If you, Boom. What is it? You stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Correct. Helpful. OK, so um, there aren't note cards. You're just going to need to stand where you are. Yeah, raise your hand. I'll point to you. Here's the thing. Please ask a question. <laughs> Please. Do it for the culture, OK? Because I, I see this room, it's looking a little lit. Y you, might, you might get called out by some of your peers <laughs> if, if you lead with a statement, OK? All right, um, I, I saw your hand first. He's so Hi. mean. <laughs> Don't put this on me. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Hi. Um, Yeah, I wrote that essay in graduate school, and uh, I was thinking about the women, uh, my best friend, one of my best friends, Laurence, and she was my rock during graduate school. And we would just commiserate about the hell that is getting a PhD, and especially, we, I wrote that during my dissertation year, so I didn't have to work on my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> And I just thought about the women friends I had accumulated because earlier in my life, I was, one, as I note in the essay, one of the women who said, I only have guy friends. I can't make friends with other women. And I realized why I couldn't make friends with other women, that I was buying into a lot of these societal misconceptions about women and how women relate. And I run into it all the time. Like, all, I don't know, everywhere I go, someone comes up to me in the signing line and just says, you know, women are so competitive as if that's unique to women and men are, you know, just angels of no competition. I'm like, have you seen football? Um, and so I was just really thinking about the nature of those friendships and how solid they were and what they did for me mm. and what I did for them in return. And so it was very easy to come up with a list of the qualities that we demonstrated toward one, each one another. And so I just focused on the quality of that friendship. Well, yes, you're, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I think I would just tell my younger self to have more confidence. I never really believed in my writing. I just thought, oh, it's a silly little hobby, and it doesn't really matter, and you're not really saying anything important, and nobody cares about your little tragic girl stories. And I wish I just had believed a little more, uh, a lot sooner. Was there a breakthrough moment? Yeah, bad feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking, <laughs> just checking, because you no. were like, it hasn't come yet, and then we could all like stand no, up. No, that's a good question. It's, it's still coming, but you get to a point in your career where things are going so well that you can't deny that maybe you have some talent. Um, <laughs> yeah, you see how I qualified that? <laughs> maybe, maybe. But I, I'm, I'm still working on confidence, but it's easier now, okay. because there's external validation. And I know a lot of people are like, you don't need any validation. I mean, good for you. Um, <laughs> Give yours to us. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm, I need external validation. I write regardless, and I've always written right. regardless, and if all this went away, I would still write. But when people like your work, and when people find solace and feel seen by your work, that's a, an extraordinary thing. Right on. Right on. Um, oh, and well, up there, you can actually, yes. Yeah? Yes. Uh, can we just say the acoustics in this room are fantastic? Perfect. <laughs> it sounded like you were standing I mean, right there. That was crystal clear. Okay, 92nd um, Street, why? But that was a great question. 
You know, I don't think, I think we have to rely on each other and connect to each other more than ever as women. And I think people of color, queer people, trans people, anyone who is going to be made more vulnerable by Donald Trump and the shit show of cabinet members that he's assembled, uh, I think we have to stay strongly bonded. One of the things that concerns me is that I've seen some think pieces and essays in recent weeks about how feminism has died and feminism has failed. And I just think, what luxury to be able to declare something like that <laughs> simply because Hillary Clinton lost. That's not how this works, because that's saying that she was feminism. Hmm. That, I mean, which is to say that, oh, uh, that's some white feminist <laughs> bullshit right there. Um, and so I think the first thing is to recognize that Hillary Clinton losing was not a failure of feminism, but rather the success of racism and misogyny. Um, and so we need to keep our eyes on what the real problem is. And certainly I think we need to have some very stern conversations with ourselves and with each other about the state of feminism and a lot of the performative feminism that has become very popular in recent years. But I think that feminism is vibrant and necessary and thriving. Uh, and look at how many people voted for Hillary Clinton. More people voted for her. So I think feminism is okay. And I just think we need to remember that in our relationships with other women rather than turning on each other because that's easier. Um, mm. Divide and conquer is how they win. And so I'm just, I think we have to actively work against that. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We'll get to as many of you as we can. Go ahead. Is that Jackie Woodson? Wow! <laughs> wow! Hi. Isn't this fancy? <laughs> hey. Nice to meet you. Maybe you'll sign something for me uh, later. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, that's a really good Oof. question. And that is the question. <laughs> I'm not. I, I've been on the road since May 2014 when I took Untamed State out. And the requests just keep coming and I have a really hard time saying no. And part of it is just my natural insecurity where I think I may never get another request. So I have to say yes to going to Timbuktu. Um, <laughs> And so writing time happens on airplanes and in hotel rooms. And that's one reason why Hunger is a year, it's literally gonna be put out a year after it was originally supposed to be put out. And I've heard some bizarre rumors and like, oh, the, the book wasn't bad. The book wasn't written. <laughs> <laughs> and, Cause I just had no time. And it's interesting that it seems like I've keep putting books out, but it's been two years since I published a book, which is not a long time, but felt like a long time. Mm. It's hard to find writing time. And so next year, uh, 2018, I'm dedicating to writing. I'm gonna still do some gigs because quite frankly, the money is absurd. Um, <laughs> and I have a lot of student loans. <laughs> That's just the reality. I have a lot of student loans and I teach at a state university. So something's gotta, compensate for that. Um, but I, I haven't been able to make as much time, but I, I just make myself do it. And like even tonight, I'm gonna go and work after wow. I do all this. But it's also my happy place when I'm stressed and it, it can be very lonely on the road. And so when I turn to my writing at like 10 or 11 after an event, it's a, it's a nice coming down and it's a nice reminder of what I truly want to do and where, you know, what my true purpose is. This is great, don't get me wrong, this is fabulous. But this doesn't happen if I don't write. Right, right. National Book Award winners get to break yes, rules. Yes, by the way. <laughs> I'll defer to you, you yeah. oh. 
Um, yeah, in the back. Yeah. Hi. Oh. 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 Damn, like that's some dueling banjos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to start with you and then the other person. Uh, that's okay. I saw you. How has the toxic political climate affected my writing and creativity? It has inspired me to write. It has emboldened me to do things that I was previously afraid to do. But if Donald Trump, who has no experience with any sort of political office and who has such a disgraceful life, can become president of the United States, then I can write a screenplay. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I I'm sitting here like eyes emoji. <laughs> <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> I feel very invigorated. I was devastated after November 8th. In fact, my mom called me on November 9th and had to force me to get out of bed. Mm. It was devastating. I really didn't see it coming. I got it so wrong. And so, of course, I'm like embarrassed, like, fuck, because I was telling everyone I was telling my best friend because she was worried the day before. And I was like, oh, no, it's going to be fine, baby. It's going to be fine. <laughs> And I was really confident, and I was really wrong. And I mean, I and many others, but it, that took the, the wind out of my sails for a few weeks, and I didn't really have anything to say. But I think now more than ever, we have to speak up, and we have to say what we want to say, and not just politically. I think that if we have stories that we've been dying to tell or poems we really have to write, we should be doing it now, because who knows? I don't believe in all of the fatalism that's going around. And I think people are just sort of fetishizing like how bad it's gonna get. For most of us, if we're fetishizing about it on Twitter from our iPhones, we're gonna be fine. <laughs> uh, we're not the vulnerable people that are truly gonna be affected. Um, but I just feel invigorated. I just feel like we cannot let him be reelected in 2020. So what do I do today to work toward that not being a possibility. Uh, who was the other person that stood? Okay. Oh. Okay. Hi. I was just curious what you thought Mm-hmm. It's not entirely conscious, but it's not unconscious. There is a level of craft involved. I, I think about repetition and try to use repetition when, to make very specific points. A part of using a phrase like, and yet, is that I want to trust the reader. I don't feel like I need to spoon feed everything to the reader, especially in my nonfiction. I'm making very careful choices about what kinds of information do I need to give the reader so that they can feel well informed on this topic that I'm writing about. What kinds of information do I include so that I can be persuasive as possible? What kinds of information do I include so that I'm acknowledging that my point of view is not the only point of view, but that I'm right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, where, where, do, where do I need to pull back and not be so heavy handed? And this is, of course, a work in progress. I'm relatively new to nonfiction. I've only been writing nonfiction for, uh, well, I guess it's not that new anymore. It's seven years. Um, and so, it, you know, in a lot of my earlier nonfiction, I just felt like, oh, I have to give them everything all at once. I just have to just really pour it on and just hope that quantity gets the point across. But I love using devices like And Yet when I want to focus more on letting the reader do some of the work and where I just want to leave that moment and just sort of let people fill in that space that's mm. created by And Yet. Uh, yes, over there. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. 
<laughs> oh, you all just adorable. Physically? Oh, on my couch watching Law and Order. <laughs> that I, I do most of my writing. I have a desk, <laughs> but I, I do most of my writing. My favorite laptop to write on is a MacBook Air, and I just sit on my couch. I bought a very fancy couch. Um, it, I, it's called the Sex Couch. It's so great. <laughs> It's a Chesterfield, but I love it. I was about it. to say, it was like, is it called or do you call? I call it the sex couch. Okay. It's leather and it's from Restoration Hardware and oh, it's super it obnoxious. And it's the only nice thing I've ever bought for myself. Hmm. And so I just sit on it and I feel just enveloped in joy. And I write and I like look at this episode of SVU that I've seen a million times. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, Olivia. <laughs> So that's my happy place. I love it. Uh, yes. Hi. Okay. <laughs> That's a Friends, very high five to a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that was a, now. <laughs> yeah, that was a <laughs> nailed it. Wow. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> well. Well. I would choose pleasure. I would absolutely choose pleasure because I don't think that women are defined by the pain that we experience. Um, and I feel so much joy mm. as a woman. Uh, I think I love my boobs. They're just great. I mean, ample and fantastic. <laughs> that's ample and that's fantastic. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm only doing Q and A's with friends for the rest of my career. Mm. This is it. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> uh, he watches everything. No, oh, he's gonna be so happy. <laughs> but I really think it, if I had to choose, I would choose pleasure because the pleasure is so immense, and the things that we get to do, and the ways in which we move through the world as women the good things far outweigh the bad. The bad is significant and we can't overlook it, but I would write pleasure all, all the ways, yeah. Wow. We have time for about two more questions. Okay, sounds like a plan, Stan. <laughs> Magenta. <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, I'm okay. Do you like walks on the beach? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sasha. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm Caribbean myself, and it really influences my, my writing as well. So I want to know, because that's so deeply rooted in Haitian culture, how does communication, Haitian American influence your work? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I grew up in Nebraska in a predominantly white area, but my parents raised my brothers and I as Haitians in America. Our Haitian identity was so much a central part and one of the key things about our Haitian identity was that our ancestors were free. Mm. And uh, that was, that's a powerful thing, mm. to grow up black in America and to be told every day you are the children of kings and queens and that your ancestors were free, freed us from a lot of the psychological burdens that I think a lot of people have to carry. Wow. And I think that's what gives me the courage to do the things that I do in my writing. So my Haitian identity is intrinsic to my writing. There mm. is not one without the other. Wow. Mm. wow. That's
Okay, I see so many hands. Well, okay, maybe three more, but we're gonna make them fast, <laughs> fast. Boom. Yeah, you. You and then you. It's good, yeah. Yes. In some ways, my approach is very similar. Storytelling is storytelling, but uh, there's a different urgency with each genre. With comic book writing, I, I've been th I have to think in terms of scene, and you have to break down how people are going to, how characters are going to get from one panel to the next, and so it's a much more intimate style of writing and thinking about things in very specific ways that you may not necessarily have to do in broader forms of fiction. When I'm writing a short story or a novel, I'm really just thinking about how do I want the reader to feel, but what's going to happen? Who are the characters? And so I'm trying to put all these different elements together to create a story that is indelible in some form or fashion. With my nonfiction, I'm really thinking about how do I reach the person who is most inclined to disagree with me? because it's very easy to persuade the people who are already on board with my ideologies. Uh, the challenge is how do I reach someone who is completely different from me and who disagrees with everything I say, and trust me, those people are a legion. I hear from them all the time. Mm. <laughs> They're often named Mike. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Got you, girl. Mike with his one female friend. Females are animals, women are human. Drag ha! Um, oh, I'm so petty. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm definitely thinking about persuasion mm. and what can I do to be as persuasive as possible. Also, uh, my PhD is actually in rhetoric and technical communication. And so I spent five years studying how to be persuasive. <laughs> and when people are like, how do you do it? I'm like, I went to school. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think about the rhetorical appeals of ethos, pathos, and logos. As cheesy as that sounds, that shit is real. <laughs> Yes. Yes, you. You're a high school student. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. Ooh. You know, I think when you're young, people just tell you it gets better. And that's very easy to say. But I think that it's OK to demand that things be better when right now, wow. where you are, and how your life is now. It's OK to say, this is not OK. It's OK to push back against things that people want you to just suck up. Um, and I think that in many ways, we encounter more racism and sexism when we're younger because people know we're more vulnerable. And so I think, don't be afraid to push back and don't be afraid to use your voice and say, no, this is not OK. And don't get down on yourself when you can't find the courage, because it's hard to stand up for yourself. It's hard for me at 42. So I can't imagine, like when I was in high school, I never stood up for myself. I was just a doormat. And if I could go back and tell myself anything, it would be, you don't have to be a doormat to get along. You don't have to be the good girl to make people l tolerate you. Uh, and it's okay to be unliked, and it's okay to make people uncomfortable. And I think that's the biggest thing that people need to embrace is discomfort. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to have opinions that other people don't like. Mm. So just be unlikable. Cool. <laughs> One more question. Okay. All right. Yes. That's a great question. 
I think that people are starting to dis demystify money and publishing because it, I think it goes along with equal pay and the demand for equal pay. I think that people need to be more upfront about what you're making because when we're quiet about it, that's what allows publishers to pay you bullshit because everybody keeps it a secret because we're so desperate for the money and we're so desperate to be published that we think, okay, I'm gonna take this shitty ass scrap that you're handing me. And uh, so many women writers, like I'm in, on a couple Facebook groups for women writers and they talk about, yeah, I got a pay raise from $50 a piece to $75 a piece. And I just think, what? And I, but I've written for $50 a piece. I, as recently as last year. Wow. And I've written for free. And I, so I think we have to demystify the process. I also think people need a more realistic sense of what book advances are for literary fiction and for nonfiction and what women of color get versus white women. There's a stark difference and I am fine with saying that. And I think that some people don't like to admit it, but the pay difference, I like, I read Cheryl Strayed's piece where she was like, I got $100,000 for my first novel. I'm like, what? How many novels do I write to get that in advance? Like, it's crazy. Well, that, not anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> still. I think it's good that we put that information out there so I can say I got 12500 for my first novel. And there was no difference, I think, where Cheryl was in 2005, 2004, and where I was when I sold my novel in terms of background. And so the more we talk about this, I think the more agents can be empowered on our behalf to get more money for our books and at least just put it out there. I do think there comes a point where you can't talk about the money anymore for safety reasons. Mm. I do, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> So I just think it's people want to know. And also I think the gender pay gap in publishing is stark, like Milo, $250,000, let's, you know, like, okay, let's all just talk about what we got while he got this quarter of a million dollars. But yeah, it's good stuff. Right, one last question. Last question. Whoever jumps up first. <laughs> all right. Oh, look out, look out. She <laughs> had you. She got you. All right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so she wants to know how you can find a place to do writing in, the, in academia that you find truly exciting and invigorating when there are so many strictures against that. Uh, academics don't write to be read. So, um, <laughs> what I did is I did what I had to do to play the game and I wrote what I wanted to write and published outside of academia as well. I, I don't know how to break the system. I don't, I don't, the system is so rigid and the tenure system is so complicated that you have to play the game. There's just no way around it and so you have to play the game and do your own thing at the same time. I don't know of many ways to combine the two. I do think there are some scholars who are doing some really exciting stuff. So Tressie McMillan Cotton, who has a really great book coming out called Lower Ed, is this really, it's an academic book, but it's also a mass market book. Anyone can read it. And it's about for-profit colleges and mm. universities. And she found a way to toe that line. And she always finds a way. Her work is both academic and rigorous mm -hmm. and accessible for people without PhDs. And so I would recommend her as a really great model for how to play the game, but also write what makes you passionate because she loves her work. And what Laura Ed will come out in a month, I think? Fe end of February? Oh, <laughs> hey. <Hello. laughs> And you'll be able to, I think you, that's a really good model. And also the pieces that she writes for The Atlantic, she wrote a great response to ta Coates' recent piece about my president was black. And she had a very thoughtful response that I think worked really well. And that is another great model for how to write passionately and also satisfy um, academia.
All right. All right. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Please join me. Oh, no, stop.